essential oils have an inherent connection with nature, with the world around us. At the Young Living Farm in Mona, Utah, anyone can come see the distillery and fields where some of the Young Living products began. But there is so much more to do there to escape suburban life and feel and smell the great outdoors. Young Living has camels, elk, bison, a whole petting zoo, and all shapes and sizes of horses, some of which participated in the 2021 World Champion Young Living Draft Horse Team. Hello and welcome to Young Living's podcast, The Wild Drop. My name is Jacob Young, your host. Young Living is the world leader in producing and distributing premium essential oils. This podcast will provide you with drops of information about Young Living, including stories, history, products, lots of little fun facts, and even more. We'll also give you an opportunity to get some free product. In studio with us today is Brittany and Tim Sparrow. Together, they manage the Pertron Show team for Young Living. Tim, Brittany, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So you guys just got back from a draft horse show in... Michigan. Michigan. Wow. And you all did fairly well there? Yeah. Yeah, Lansing, Michigan. There, we th- hooked the six twice. Uh, first time we were third. Second time we were first. Um, and it was the end of a long summer. Oh, I don't doubt it. And with that long summer, kind of uh, talk about that summer that you just experienced. So... You had the World Championships in Shipshawana. After that, we had our draft horse show at our Mona Farm. And then after that, you went to Heber, Utah, for another show. And right after that was Minnesota. We laid over in Minnesota, and then we hit the show in Lansing, Michigan. So that was really just our fall run. We basically start competing for the year as soon as the previous year is done. So last year left us with a little bit of a sour taste in our mouth. We had placed third at the world finals and that kind of gave us a little more grit. So we rallied back. And as you said, we hit the summer because it's accumulation of points. Yeah. So at every competition we get points and the top four in our breed, the Pertrons, the top four in the Belgians and the top four in the Clyde Shire breeds will make it to the final. So those top 12. So it's a year long process. So last September we buckled down and we decided that this third was not acceptable. So we hit the shows all over the Midwest. We traveled as far south as Florida. We went to Indiana, Ohio, and back several, several times because the Midwest really is the heart of draft horse country. Mm -hmm. And that all came together for the finals in Shipshawana. Wow. So going back, for somebody who's never been to a draft horse show before, when they walk in and sit down in the arena, what are they to see and what are they to expect from that show? Well, at a draft horse show, you hook up uh, from a single horse up to an eight-horse hitch at, at some shows. Most shows, only a six-horse hitch. Uh, at our show, we have an eight-horse hitch. But, uh, you know, the horses, they come in at a trot. Um, the judge is looking. They're judged by one person, and they're looking for the performance of the horse, how their head carriage, how they travel, their sound when they travel. Like, they're they're not huffing they're, and puffing. Yeah, they're they're breathing well. And uh, so you're looking for the overall performance of the horse, how they're working together, their overall overall picture of the unit, and how they're performing as individuals. Great. So in that show, what exactly are they doing as far as the uniform? Because they go around Mm -hmm. in a circle, and then they change, and they reverse back across, and then do a circle again. Um, Can you kind of explain why they do that? Oh, we come in, and we work the first direction, which would be counterclockwise. Uh, you do depending on the size of the ring a, a couple laps and that gives the judge the opportunity to see like especially in a multiple see the left hand horse more and see how they they travel in the corners to the left and and perform and then you reverse and you switch directions so you you get a chance to see the other side of the hitch mm-hmm. and then you see how that horse travels and how they work together that direction so i mean some sometimes you have you, you'll come in and then the team will be working really good to the left and you reverse and it's just just falls apart for so whatever reason like you know a horse just not having a good day or or whatnot but they're just like us they have their moments but so that the judge can get an equal opportunity to see each side of the hitch gotcha so just like our episode from two weeks ago or i guess two episodes ago 
I kind of made the point and suggestion that jousting is not something that you just get into, right? It's something that you're introduced to or you're born into. And so for you two, I asked the same question. How did you get involved in this scenario? So I'll give my story first. Just like you said, you were either introduced or born into it, and I was born into this. So I credit that to my parents, my dad, and I'm the fifth generation in my family to be involved in the draft horses. And at the age of three, he came home and he said, I'm going to buy and sell horses for a living. So we literally had any type, any breed, any horse come through the farm. The biggest bulk of the clients was the Amish communities Mm -hmm. in our area, but then also all over the country. We would have draft horses going to pleasure team, someone that just wants to be a hobbyist. They just want to have a nice team in the yard. They want to take them to their local parade. Or we'd have horses that were at the competition level and they're showing and things like that. So my sisters and I literally woke up and we went out to the barn every day and hopped on whatever pony or horse was there and drove and rode and did everything possible. From there, my aunt actually introduced us to specifically the showing realm because my dad had taken it to the pulling aspect with the draft horses. That's what he had done with his father and my aunt. When she was younger, she had done more of the showing So with my grandfather. So that's why we did that. So my sisters and I, we went along with my aunt, and that's where we learned how to do the competition and the showing. And from there, we took a little stint of a break, and we talked to our parents and said, we love the horses and we love the draft horses, but everybody in our family does this, so we want to change it up a bit. And so we did some quarter horse shows, some pleasure, things like that. Then I met Tim, and it's been draft horses ever since. (laughs) (laughs) So you got out of what you didn't want to do just to get back into it. Well, I wouldn't say I didn't want to do it. We just wanted a little bit of a break, like you said. Want to do something different. And and to experience the different disciplines with the draft horses and different things that you can pull on from the different disciplines. I feel like we use that every day because we're learning different different tools and techniques. That's awesome. And Tim, what about you? I, I grew up in it. My, I think I'm the seventh generation to live on our family farm in in Iowa. Uh, we had draft horses all all along, uh, and, and cattle and and farmed. Uh, but the horses are always my favorite thing to do. Uh, we have Belgian draft horses, and uh, my grandfather, and uh, I think in '76 set, set the Guinness Book World Record for driving 48 head of horses at one time. Wow! Um, so that record has since been broken. But uh, he's traveled the country with what was called the 40 horse hitch. So it was hooked uh, four abreast, four wide, ten deep, uh, in the seventies, and uh, for yeah for five years all over the country. I mean, the, the Rose Bowl, the Cotton Bowl parade, and did exhibitions with the forty. And uh, so, and then then he moved into like doing doing exhibitions with with uh, six horse hitch, uh, kind of like like for lack of a better Budweiser Clydesdales do. Yeah, but it, with a six horse hitch, and he actually he would run them. Wow! At the end, uh, it was part of the part of the act. So it was, I bet that was really scary to witness and yeah. be part of because I can't imagine him holding all the reins. I mean, I just see all the reins that you hold with the six horse. So I can't imagine a forty horse hitch with all of those reins. How do you like? Is he holding all forty, or is it like cut down to like the six and the eight that you usually do? Or so there was there was five lines in each hand, and oh so he goodness. had lines on on five of the teams. And then the other five teams were were use use straps to back to the other ones uh-huh. to keep them from charging on and, and to kind of control them. There was also uh, assistance from from outriders and things like they'd make corners in in city streets and you couldn't see the lead team because they were going around a big building. Yeah. So yeah, there was five lines in each hand. So you didn't have a you know otherwise you'd had had ten lines in each hand to control the whole thing. And then it would just be very confusing to try and maneuver. Oh but, my. Uh, and, and we continued to do that one from uh, eighty nine to two thousand two. My father did the same. Th- did the forty horse hitch, and we just we did, just did, went and did one parade in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, every year. But uh, I was I drove them pretty much in a straight line. But I I drove the forty a few times. But I knew from a young kid. I think I was probably ten, twelve years old. I knew I wanted to make a living driving horses and and more of the showing. We we showed. Yeah. Uh, with the, doing 
you know, the different exhibitions and things, but showing was always my favorite. I'm competitive and I just always enjoyed it. And, uh, I met Brittany, I graduated high school. I started working for a couple of friends, the milk cows and showed perch on horses that, uh, didn't live far from, from Brittany's parents in Minnesota, worked for the summer for them. And then I went on to, uh, Ames construction. They had a hitch of horses and I worked there for 12 and a half years and we showed competitively and, and had won a couple of world, world championships and we were, it was reserve a few times. And, uh, so I brought those experiences f- from, from a little kid to working at Ames all the way, you know, to here to young living. Wow. I think that's absolutely amazing. I couldn't do what you guys do. That is for sure. And then I think it's also amazing and great that you two met up doing what you both love. And so that makes it even better. So we've talked about Clydesdales and we've talked about Pertrons um, and we've talked about Belgians. And a lot of people probably don't know what you're talking about as far as what those are. So why don't you talk about the different breeds that are involved in the draft horse teams and how they're different from the little pony that you buy your daughter or the um, quarter horses that you usually ride. What makes them different? Okay. So basically the draft horses were back in the day used as war horses. They were in the riding aspect. And then when we came over to the United States, we're farming, we're building these cities. We need to pull these massive, massive loads. That's where they began for the driving aspect. And really, back in the day, the horses were your advertising. They were your 18-wheelers. They were your billboards going up and down the street. So the idea of a team of horses being used for advertising for a company is not new. And that's where the Pertrons were very popular. Yeah. And so, like you said, people are probably picturing the other breeds. But the Pertrons (laughs) that we have originated in France, all of ours are bred in North America one actually was bred at the Mona Farm, yep. so we're very proud of him, Baja. And so our Pertrons, they can come in gray or black. The ones that we compete with, they're all coal black. From their head to their feet, they're all coal black. Then the Belgians, those would be more of a sorrel and blonde color. They originate in Belgium, and they sometimes have the white strips down their faces, or mm-hmm. they have white legs. And then you have your Clyde Shires, which everybody probably knows from the Budweiser Clydesdales. They're the bay color. They have the white feathering on their legs, and they originate in Scotland. There is, we had mentioned the Shires. They're from England. They look very similar to the Clydes, but they can often be a little bit more in black, darker color, but they have that distinct white feathering around their legs. So those are the prime draft horse breeds that are used for competition, especially when we refer to the six horse hitch, we're involved in the North American classic series. And those are the breeds that are recognized by that series. You know, like, like Brittany mentioned, these horses originally used for riding like knights and heavy armor. They need a big, heavy horse to, to carry them in a battle. Uh, but now these horses, you know, they've, they've grown in size and stature and they're, very big, very powerful to ride on. So their ride isn't very smooth. No, they are not. <laughs> and, uh, and which Jacob could attest to, he, uh, you know, a big, big draft horse, you know, they, they'll be six, two or three at their withers, which is pretty much like their shoulder and, uh, you know, weigh 21 to 2,200 pounds. And so you can imagine there's a lot of width there too. So your legs have to spread very wide. Yep. It's just not a very comfortable ride. There is going to be more people, uh, doing riding with them, but it's not something, like the horses we have wouldn't, you know, they just haven't been bred for that. They're not trained for that. It's just a totally different discipline. But that is the, like, that would be the biggest reason is your, is the ride, the smoothest of the ride and the comfortable of the, how comfortable the ride is. It would be the big reason why, you know, they're more driven. Yeah. So everybody is pretty familiar with what they do during the on season. Mm-hmm. You talked about how you accumulate points mm-hmm. and then, based off of those points, that decides whether you are allowed to go to the world championships or not. I think a lot of people want to know, what do the horses do during the off season? Well, like right now, we just got back. We're done showing. They'll have about a a three- to four-week break, and then we start uh, getting them back into shape and training them for uh, the Denver Stock Show in in January. So, you know, we we have turnouts for them now. And, and turnouts are pastures and pens that they can run out into. And yeah, yeah. So they, have, you know, just 
relax and be a little bit of a horse and go out and play and just kind of help their body and mind heal yeah and re- recover so uh, just just like just they're they're just big big athletes so just eat and be happy yep not fat yep. you can't let them be fat yeah, they okay. have to they have to be conditioned and stuff so and then we just ease them back into driving like when, when we give them that much of a break we'll just drive them all oh, three days a week and trying to ease them back into it not pulling too big of a load or anything or ch- uh, or you know asking the you know you're just, just kind of starting from scratch yeah you're getting their, their legs back underneath of them and then you know then we start training well we do pull a sled some and uh you know we ask their hor- the horses to carry their heads very high we do not do that on on a sled when they're pulling a load we ask them to just carry their head where they're comfortable but that the sled helps them the to use their hind quarters their hind legs to to drive up underneath themselves to carry their heads high and have the front motion like pick their feet their front feet up high so that work right there you know you just kind of get them back and get the muscles back working and and build that muscle tone up so then when they do we do ask them to perform they're everything's in you know ideally is in shape like an like i said like an athlete so that you don't strain something or hurt something that isn't um back into conditioning and everything yeah and then you know as we get closer to the show we we do a little bit more trotting and stuff to help build their cardio up into practice you know, any just like any athlete, they're good at their craft because they practice it a lot. Yeah. So it's a fine line to not practice it, practice the trotting and do too too much trotting, because you don't want to you don't want to wear them out before you get to the show or break them down, mm-hmm. because the shows are you know, they're they're intense. Yeah. The you know, and a professional athlete doesn't compete at the same level year round all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just practicing the basics over and over and over. Yeah. And just like you said, that's what makes the professionals so good at what they do because they just simply practice the basics. No, that's great. I I think one thing that one that people would like to know is obviously the horses don't do this their entire life. So once they hit their retirement period, what what do they do after that? Do they go to a different farm or do they just kind of lay out in the pen and just be fat and happy for the rest of their life? Or what happens after that? So that's where we get to have a lot of success or we've, we've had a lot of success with our retirement plans for our horses. And we've put horses at different times, whether it may be age or simply a horse just hasn't matured into what we thought they would be. We had a horse a couple months ago that... He really, the ri- the driving was just not taking for him. And we always would look at him in the pasture and we'd be like, he looks like a giant quarter horse. Yeah. So we started riding him and he loved it. He took to it so well. And now he's backpacking in the mountains hunting elk. That's awesome. We have another horse. He is a babysitter. He will take care of you day in and day out. <laughs> and so we had a couple that contacted us when it was time for him to retire, he didn't necessarily – he still wanted to work. And I think yeah. that's a big important part for the, the horses. When we call it work, it's it's not like you and I think of it. They want to do it's a job. It's play for them. Yeah. yeah. So they had a campground in the summer. They have rides, and they love to give hay rides with their teams. So they bought a team of horses. They already had another team of horses. And just last night I saw them playing around with their horses, and they hooked up to a four. That that's was awesome. just something that was a dream of theirs to have. They don't necessarily want to go and compete. And he's their babysitter, and he takes care of them because they said, if we hook anything wrong or do anything wrong, he's just going to do it right because he knows. Yeah. So we really try to find the right fit for the right horse at the right time for them so that – because they've given us so much, and we've asked so much of them, and we get very close because yeah. we're with them 365 days a year, <laughs> just like your kids. So we want to make sure that we've given them the the next step in their life is the best. That's great. Yeah. And that's, I think that's way better than just letting them run out into a pasture. They have to do something. I know after we retired my dad's jousting horse, Simeon, she kind of would go a little bit crazy after being in the pasture for a while because she just, she wanted something to do. Exactly. So every now and then, you know, once a month we let her in the arena just to run around and stuff and you can just she lights up like crazy because that's what she loved doing was doing that so i think that's great that you give them something to do that's similar to what they were doing but it's less than what they're doing so it's not as taxing on them um i think that's great that's a great retirement program so as far as you know there there's a saying that goes you work hard and you play hard but at the same time when you do both of those things you have to recover as well so when you're taking care of these 
big, amazing, wonderful animals. What does that process look like? Well, like the, one of the biggest things, in, like in their feed ration, we use uh, an inch red twice a day. And I feel like that helps, it seems like that helps them, their muscles recover and yep. and re- keeps their energy level up. And uh, we use the Cool Zool oil, especially like in the winter, we don't rinse them necessarily every day. And we spritz them with that. Or or put it in a bucket of water and sponge them on to help them cool down and and just uh, after a workout. Yeah. Or a cool little gel we use on different muscle groups on their body, uh, some on their neck and their backs, where you know where they're where they're working and stuff and, and driving like show horses where you know tends to have the most uh, strain. Yeah. And uh, the animal scents we use on a lot of the wounds, uh, lavender spray. Yeah. The the mist. Well, uh, as far as wounds go, because I don't want someone to get the wrong mm. idea, how how do they acquire wounds per se? Like, where what's the most common wound that you see as far as them like rubbing up against something? Or I mean, that would say that's that's the biggest thing. Usually, it's something they've done to themselves uh, out playing out in the lot or something. You know, they step on themselves or rubbing on a stall or something. A lot of times, they do a lot of these things themselves. You know, we just help. It helps moisturize, moisturize it and keep it, yeah, and and help it to heal. Okay, great. Another biggest one is thieves. We clean oh. everything with thieves because just like you and your own home, your own family, if we're gonna clean out a bucket that they're gonna drink and eat out of later, I don't want a harsh chemical in there to give them a chemical burn. So everything at the stalls is all cleaned down with thieves. We even have a sprayer when we get into a new setting and we spray down the stalls, or in general, my son just sprays everything with these because he <laughs> thinks it just smells good because we're in a barn. So everything should smell like thieves. That is too <laughs> funny. It's great. Thieves is amazing. We all love thieves. So as far as the draft horse team goes, and we also talked about a little bit of jousting down at the Mona Farm, what else is there down there? There is almost everything for your family to go and see and experience. This may be taking it a step back further than that. Um, I don't know if you know our backstory of how we got to Young Living. I do, but those listening don't. So, obviously, we were showing, we were competing with Ames Construction, and it's a small world in the draft horses, so we knew your dad, we knew him starting up this hitch and things. This had to have now been seven years ago. He called Tim, and he said, I want to start this horse hitch, and I want you to be the manager. And I'm literally... If I was sitting here right now, I'd be touching the table because I am seven months pregnant. And he, Tim's telling me about this, and we've dreamed about this, and this is everything we've ever worked for, and this is everything that we want, but I am seven months pregnant, and we cannot fathom picking up our family and moving across the country. I don't even know if we can make it across the country or where I'm, yeah. <laughs> and so, hesitantly, he said no. And I think your dad, maybe Tim can attest to that conversation. Yeah, he did. He... he you know, I had talked to him and he said, well, you know, you know, you want, I want you to come out, interview, drive some horses and I'll shoot some horses. And, you know, I said, well, Gary, I said, right now on, on our stage of our lives, I said, I don't, I don't want to waste your time or your resources. I just feel like it's not the right time for me. I said, so, you know, I don't think he was real thr- thrilled with me, <laughs> but then it was just it, about a year later. It was exactly, that is the part that fat, that I still go back to every day because for that next year, we'd look at each other and we'd be like, "Did was that literally the biggest mistake of our lives? Because there's only so many opportunities. Yeah. And literally that day on our daughter's first birthday, we got the call that he was looking for another, a new Pertron manager. And we both looked at each other and we're like, how did this happen? How this literally happened to the day. The reason we couldn't go a year ago was because I was pregnant. And now on her first birthday, they're a little more, got things a little more together. Yeah. And, and in, we were like, okay, we basically had gone over everything. You can pretty much know a job on paper. Before we even flew out to Utah, there was just basically one question that we need to ask your dad in person. And that was if we could do this as a family because we grew up. And as you said, typically someone does not decide to go into this industry, work 
this many hours at 18 years old. You're born into it and you love it for a reason. And that's what he said. That's why this farm is here. This farm could simply just be crops and a distillery. And it's not. It is here because I knew that adults would come and they'd want to see the distillery. They'd want to see how the crops are grown. They'd want to see the seed distill process. And kids would be tugging at their parents saying, come on, come on, let's go, let's go. I'm bored, I'm bored. (laughs) And he said, I wanted that to be the reverse. I wanted the kids to be here. I wanted them to see the horses. I wanted them to walk through the fields. I wanted them to have all these activities and places for a safe place for a family to go and experience all this. And I wanted it to be the parents saying to their kids, come on, guys, we need to go. And (laughs) now we literally get to say that to our kids every day. It's guys, it's time for us to go. (laughs) That's awesome. And I'm, I'm so glad for both of you that you're able to do it as a family thing. Um, I think it's amazing, especially to see Rylan and him compete as well. And watching him compete in the cart during the world championships was just awesome to see. And just seeing your two little daughters running around, too, I think it's just the greatest and most wonderful thing ever. So we think so. Well, and I think the big reason why there is it is the draw for adults and kids. There's so many activities for the kids, but also there's such a like you don't have to know animals or horses or anything. And it's very intriguing because we have our our Pertron show team. Um, Then but there also there's the, the jousting department. And, you know, that's, I mean, how, how many people do that? That's, yeah. that's pretty neat. <laughs> I mean, it, it's pretty intense, too. It is. It is indeed. <laughs> but, uh, and then, so then you, you can get a ride on the trolley around the farm and, and see the Frisians. So there's just so much to do there. Not During, besides the, fr- the Frisians, there's, oh, oh yeah. There, there are miniature cattle, there's, a camel. There's we have elk, our there's, petting zoo. Yeah. And then during our events, you know, like during our Easter extravaganza, we have an Easter egg hunt going on. During our uh, lavender days, we have our lavender harvest and the 5K through the lavender, which is beautiful and gorgeous. You start early in the morning from the sunrise and you get a run through the fields. It's, it's great. And fall festival, we've got the PCRA rodeo, which was amazing this year. Um, pontoon boats. and uh, I was just going to say. There's no other place that I can think of that has all those things in one spot. We were gone for most of the construction of the new paddle boats and the splash pad and the rock wall. So my kids are definitely eyeing that up now. Thank you guys so much for joining the podcast today. Could not thank you enough. Um, We appreciate all that you do, your love, your care, your passion for the horses. Um, Everyone who has come to shows, members, non-members, they see your love and your passion and the care that you have for the horses is great. I know for a fact, especially um, for those who don't already know, you, we won the world championships this year. Um, you guys have worked extremely hard for that. And seeing all that hard work paid off was an amazing experience, especially to be there in the wagon with you guys. And I know my dad would be proud. My mom was extremely proud. Our whole team is proud here at Young Living. So thank you once again for coming on and doing all that you do. Thank you. Thank you for having us, and, and thanks for everything that you guys do for us. You're more than welcome. Just like with every episode, we want to make sure that you droppers get a chance at some free product. So for this episode, we're giving you a chance to win the Animal Sense Ointment. Pets and animals are like kids, and they manage to hurt themselves somehow and some way. But thanks to the Animal Sense Ointment, you can pamper your pet and animal with naturally derived ingredients and premium essential oils to moisturize, soothe, and nourish your pet's and animal's skin. Comment hashtag Animal Sense, S-C-E-N-T-S, down below on this YouTube video for a chance to win this amazing product. Good luck. And a big thank you again to Tim and Brittany Sparrow for sharing their love of horses and nature. And thank you all for tuning into this episode of the YL Drop. Remember, you can listen on iTunes, Spotify, on YouTube, and on our newly refurbished website at youngliving.com. Don't forget to oil up, Young Living family. This is Jacob Young, dropping out. The YL Drop is produced in our studios at Young Living Global Headquarters with assistance from Paul Eagleston, Cole Wissinger, Ren Sof, and of course our host, Jacob Young. Jacob Young.